your presence. So this morning we drink, we drink, oh God, of the streams of joy. We drink, oh God, from what you have prepared for us. Lord, we drink. The Holy Spirit is saying this morning, drink and be healed. Drink of my presence and be restored. Drink of my presence and be transformed. Drink of my presence. And how do you drink of God's presence? It's not something you physically drink. But you open up your heart and just accept it. You open up your heart and just receive it. You open up your mouth and say, Lord, I receive all that you have for me. Open up your mouth and say, Lord, I drink of your presence. That's how you actually drink. Because the Bible says that with a heart, man believes, and with a mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So if there's something you want to receive from God, you believe it in your heart and you confess it with your mouth. And that's how you experience it. Hallelujah. So Lord, say, Lord, I drink of your presence this morning. I drink of your presence this morning. Hallelujah. See Psalm 119 and verse 117. It was David that prayed this prayer. He says, let my lips overflow with your praise. Let that be our prayer this morning. Let that be your personal prayer. That you want your lips to overflow with his praise. Amen. Now pray that prayer with me. Say, Lord, Lord let my lips, let my lips overflow, overflow with praise, praise to you this morning. You this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So let's continue to praise him. You're the God of this city. You're the King of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. You're the light of this darkness. You're the hope to my 
um, this when I heard them singing this song, but I was about to come out to tell Yomi that they should sing this song today because I listened to this song all night. And the title of my message today is God of the City. So when I heard them singing it, rehearsing it, I have to come out and tell them that you guys are in the spirit. Amen. And I think that it's a message uh, for us. God wants to use that song to minister to us uh, this morning. So we're going to take it again from the beginning. And I want you to just follow the lyrics, forget about everything, focus on Him, and just worship Him. Just worship Him. You're the God of the sea. I want all of us to just sing it right now. God in the past, 
there are some things that we do not know. I'm not really in agreement. There are some things that we have not seen. In fact, the amplified version of this verse says there are things that are fenced in. Things that God has fenced in that are not yet revealed to us. Can you just give me the amplified version of Jeremiah 3 verse 3? It says, Call on me and I will answer you and I will show you great and mighty things. Fenced in and hidden. Which you do not know. You do not distinguish and recognize, have knowledge of, or understand. I just want everyone in this place to know that there is more that God wants to do with us than what we have seen. There's more that God wants to do with you than what you have seen and what you can see now. There's more. God has great plans for you. Amen. God has great plans for us. And the Bible tells us here in Jeremiah 33 that how we begin to enter into those great plans that He has for us is through prayer. It starts with prayer. So we're going to be praying right now for our city. We're going to be praying for our neighborhood. Starting from this neighborhood, going to the entire city of Chicago. We're going to lift up our voices and cry out to God for great things to take place in our neighborhoods and our city that we have not seen yet. Are you ready? Yeah. Drop anything that you have right now and let's be focused on prayer. Hallelujah. So why don't you, you know, rise up, lift up your hands with me and let's pray fervently to God for our neighborhood and for our city. We're asking God for God to reveal the great things that He has for us, that He has for our city, that He has for our neighborhood, that we have not received yet. Father, in the name of Jesus, we join our voices together as a church right now, and we lift up this, the, this community that we're in, the south side of Chicago, and we lift up, oh Lord, the city of Chicago, this great city that you have blessed with so much. Father Lord, we pray. There are things that you want to do that have not yet been done. There are things that you have planned that have not yet been manifested. Oh Lord, there are many things that you want to do. Lord, we lift up our voices right now. Just begin to pray right now. Begin to pray in the spirit. Concerning our city, concerning our neighborhoods. You know what I need you guys to do? I need you guys to stand up, walk around this place. Let's do some praying. I want you to stand up and just begin to walk around this auditorium, praying in the spirit. Let's pray, everyone. Let's begin to pray right now for those great things that God has planned. Let's begin to pray for the great things that God has planned. Let's enter into this through prayer. Let's review them through prayer. Come on, walk around and pray. There's something prophetic.
sister Nighty. Genesis chapter 19, we're still praying. Genesis chapter 19. Genesis 19. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Genesis chapter 18. Genesis chapter 18. Starting from verse 17. It says, The Lord said, Genesis 18 from verse 17. The Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Don't move forward yet. Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Remember the previous verse that we read? It says that I will show you what? Bring out mighty things or hidden things. Hidden things. Number one, the first thing you need to know is that God hides things. That's the first one. God hides things. Because it says, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing? In other words, he was trying to make a decision. Should I hide it? You know what they are. And the Bible tells us that the secret things belong to the Lord. But the things that are revealed out to us are our children. Deuteronomy 29, 29. It says the secret things belong to God. The secret things belong to God. But the things that are revealed. Ever say revealed. Revealed. Then they, they are unto us and unto our children forever. That will be do all the words of this law. So God has some secret things. There are secrets that God does not reveal. But when God reveals it, when God allows you to see it, then it becomes your possession and the possession of your children. So going back to Genesis chapter 18, shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Shall I hide? God says, seeing that he will become a great nation. He will become a great nation. Hallelujah. Let's, let's say, please, you can move forward. Saying you will become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. So God was saying now, for I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him, that they keep the will of God to do righteousness and justice, that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And the Lord said, because their outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because they are sin, everybody says sin. sin. Somebody says sin. sin. He didn't say they are sins. I said it was a whole city, so he didn't say they are sins. I'm sure, they are sin. It's very great. In other words, there was, a, there was something that was coming from that city that united into one, and that came to God. Sin always provokes God. Just like, you know, other things in focusing, sin provokes God. So the outcry against Sodom is great. Who was crying? Who was, who was crying? The outcry, the justice of God was crying out. Do you get it? And that was, it was, God always has to meet sin with justice because it's a just God. And because their sin is very great. Verse 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done all together according to the outcry against it that has come to me. And if not, I will know. Now that's a, you know, a, what you just saw in, in a biblical theological term. Uh, this is it's a, it's a righteous style where you give God human features or you, you, you write in such a way that you show that it means like a human being just for connection and all that. Say, so I will go down now and see whether they are done all together according to the outcry against it. Go to verse 22. Verse 22. Then the men turned away from there and went towards Sodom. That's the angels that came. Abraham still stood before the Lord. Because Abraham stood before the Lord. You see, I tell you, so many things are happening in our city, even in the nation. There's an onslaught of the enemy against this nation. In 
many ways. And the devil has a plan. God always you know, has a redemptive plan for every nation, every city. And the devil always wants to pollute that plan. He always wants to stop it. So you notice that the United States, the destiny of the United States, the anointing that God has given the United States is to be a pioneering nation. Everybody say pioneering nation. Now this is what I have studied prophetically. Every nation has a purpose. You know, so every city has a purpose. And the, the, when the devil wants to walk, he wants to provide the purpose. So the purpose of the United States is to be a pioneering nation. What does a pioneering nation mean? It means that it's supposed to be a peace center. It was a peace center. Yes. In other words, whatever it does, it's going to be copied all around the world. Whatever is done in the United States will be copied all around the world. I don't know if any of you have seen uh, some of these. Um, of course, you know in Africa now, right? Everybody talks like an American. That's like, the more you talk American, the, the more cool you have. So you see guys, it's not cool that they're, they're wearing you know, hats, and, you know, and sweaters, just to look like what they see on TV, and they wear heavy chains, you know, and all that. I was a little surprised when I was, there was a time I was watching, you know, like the Middle East, like all this Dubai, and in the Kuwait, and uh, what do you call it, Bahrain, and all those Middle East, like Muslim countries. You have ever seen their young people before on TV? I don't know if you've ever seen those things before. They behave like Americans. They dress that way. I mean, if you see their rap in Arabic and everything, like. <laughs> Salam alaikum. <laughs> Everybody. Now, there's nothing. I mean, let us. What I'm trying to say is that the destiny of the nation is to. Be a peace setter. To be a peace setter. Whatever is done in America, because of the place where God has put it, is going to spread around the world through media, through everything. You notice what's happening to preachers, preachers, you know, Nigerian preachers, other preachers, they, they are, you know, they want to be like Americans. And so all, the, all those things happen. I mean, I'm a Nigerian also, and I know the destiny of Nigeria also. Um, through prayer, prophetically, it was studied, and um, Nigeria is a missionary nation. I was a missionary nation. I'm using it to explain something to you. I'm going somewhere, so bear with me. It's a missionary nation. So when something is a missionary nation, what does a missionary nation do? It sends. I was say sends. Sends. People everywhere. Now, even when people are not being sent, you get what I'm saying? People are trying to get out. Do you get what I'm saying? They are trying to get out. So if you go to the embassies, you know, you see people lining up. And let me tell you the interesting thing about those people that they're going to go to different nations. They're going to either start a church there. The biggest churches in the world right now in England. In um, uh, what do you call it? In, I had that in India, in Singapore, all those things. They are Nigerian church. They are Nigerian pastor in them. Everywhere, all around the world. The biggest church is being pastor. And I'm half of South Korea and all that. They are being pastor in Nigeria. Then you see them also in military. You see them, they go everywhere because there's a missionary call upon the nation. When I travel to Africa, <laughs> in uh, East Africa especially, they always talk about Nigerians. How would they come and take over everything? <laughs> the, the Kenyans, they just come and take over. They start the business, they take over everything. It's an anointing, it's a call upon the nation. So, nations have callings, cities have callings. And one of the ways you can know the calling of a city or a nation is to try to see how Satan is trying to come across it. Are you listening? So, the United States right now, 
one of the things Satan wants to use, he wants to use the United States to export a lot of unbiblical things to make them cool, to make them acceptable. When I hear from people, for example, recently there was the Dominican Republic, they were protesting against the United States because an ambassador was forced on them, was forced on them, who was um, a promoter, was you know, openly gay and all that, and there was a protest. I was hearing from people in Dominican Republic, when you go to South Africa, go all around, and you do a diplomatic call right now, things are being forced on them, and people are, some nations are rebelling against it. I need you to understand. There's a purpose for the nation, but Satan wants to pervert it, just like he does for any nation. The nations that we call the Arab nations and all that, they have redemptive purposes. They are supposed to be the banks of the world, the wealth producers of the world, the oil wells, all those that God put there. They are supposed to produce it, but you see them. Have you seen some of those shows of those shakes and all those, how they use money? Have you ever seen before? The way they use money. Like money is like, you know, flows like water in that place. It's part of their redemptive purpose. But as you know, Satan always wants to what? Corrupt the redemptive. He always wants to corrupt that redemptive purpose. Amen? But God says something in a background. Chapter 2. We're going to come back to this place. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, it says, The whole earth will be filled. Ever say it will be filled. With the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So, meaning that there's going to come a time when every nation will contribute to the fullness of the glory of God. And what God has deposited in every nation will be revealed. <laughs> will be revealed. But before that time, that time happens, we have to take a stand. Everyone say we need to take a stand. <laughs> and the stand that you take does not stand, does not start from the placard. Someone say it doesn't start from the placard. Go back to Genesis chapter 18. That's where it starts from. And Abraham stood before the Lord. There's a lot of activism. Go to the next, the next verse. There's a lot of activism, and I believe in it. I believe in activism. I believe that you have to combine. But activism without prayer does not. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Let's try it. For we wrestle not against. Keep going, keep going. Where I got to. 21, 22, good, that's where I'm going. So, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. When you start seeing things happening and all that, you think it's just a physical thing. It's not a physical thing, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing. I believe that Chicago is supposed to be an exporter of peace. Ever say exporter of peace? A place of peace and a place of rest. People are supposed to come have vacation here and then they come into this place and there's just this relaxed thing that comes on them. And they and number two, it's supposed so that's the first thing. Satan is attacking with violence because the purpose of it is peace. Everybody say peace. So it's supposed to, to be a place where a hell of women can come and rest. The second thing, Chicago is supposed to be a diverse sea that reflects the beauty of the kingdom through connections. In other words, Chicago is supposed to, the dream of God for the city of Chicago is that South Side is not just black, uh, North Side is not just white. The dream of God for Chicago is nobody is afraid of going to one area. Because they feel they're going to be mocked or because they feel they're going to be discriminated against. The dream of God for the city of Chicago, and you notice that it's an international city. Every ethnicity in the world, if you look around, you'll find it there. 
you go to this one and you see all the Middle East, I'm sorry, you see all the Eastern people, you see India, Pakistan, and you know, and all the Asia and all that. You go to Chinatown, you see the Chinese. You go to Greek town, you go to the Ukrainian village. You go to uh, Albany Park. They said in Albany Park alone, you know, there are several nations. Like if you walk, if you walk on the street in Albany Park, you are meeting somebody from another nation. Like you just they're concentrated around the area. But you know what Satan wants to do? Everybody be afraid of one another. <laughs> Don't go to the south. Don't do that. Because that's what it has been. So they call Chicago. You see the two names they give you. The first one, there's a movie that Spike Lee is about to work on now called Shire That has to do with the violence in this aspect. Then the second one, because they said it is the most segregated city in the United States. That's number two. Then the third thing that they are saying, I want to be honest, is that over the past few years, they said a lot of people have left Chicago. Have you been following? Illinois as a whole, they calculated the number of people that have left. People are moving to Texas and moving to other places. So, a city where people are supposed to come and rest and settle and enjoy peace, people are moving away from it. And I believe also, through going to the prison and talking with some of those boys in prison and what you see around one of, the, one of the things that Satan is afraid of in this city is the destiny of the young people. He's yes. afraid of those kids. He's afraid of those kids. There's something he's scared of that those kids are supposed to do in the world that's against his plan. So what does he want to do? Kill them off. Lock them up. Disillusion them. Destroy them. But are we going to allow this to happen? No. Okay. Are we going to allow it to happen? No. Now, notice you don't even have to live in Chicago for you to be part of it. Look at this. Abraham did not live in Sodom, did he? He did not live in Sodom. But he stood before the Lord. Everybody say, he stood before the Lord. So I said, before you take a stand outside, make sure you take a stand inside. Before you take a stand out there, make sure that you've stood before God and you have received revelation from Him and you have prayed and communed with Him. Otherwise, everything that you are going to be doing outside will come to nothing. The name of our church is City Light. Meaning that we're supposed to be part of this thing that God wants to do in the entire city that brings His light and His glory there. But we cannot be that until we have stood before the Lord. Say that will try to stop us on every front. When you make up your mind that you want to do it, He will try to introduce a factor into your life to discourage you. He will try to stop you. He will try to abandon you, he will discourage you. There are some that are discouraged. There are some that are set up hopeless. Yeah, it's part of the journey. It's part of the fight. It takes God to do what He's called us to do. It takes God to do it. He said He stood before the Lord. He stood. And then what was His conversation with God? What was His conversation with God? Look at it. He says, verse 23. Verse 23. He says, Abraham came here. Everybody say, come here. Come here. Is everything everybody say, come here. come here. Today, I want you all to come here. Everybody say, come here. come here. When I say come here, I'm not talking about physically. You understand? I'm saying, come near to the presence of God. Come near to the altar, right? Come near to that place. That place where there are answers. That place where the presence of God is. Where His peace comes. Because God can do it. God can do it. Come say, God can do it. God can fix our city. God can fix our neighbors. 
God can save his children. God can do it. God can turn this, this city into a playground rather than a war, a war. What do they call it? A war. What's up? If the intention of this city, the redemptive purpose of this city is that it's supposed to be a playground. But Satan wants to turn it into a war zone. But thank God because our God is greater. Somebody say amen. Amen. Abraham came there and said, God, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? Will you cause a neighborhood where there are righteous people to dwell and dwell in there? Will you cause violence to, have, to engulf such a neighborhood? Those are the questions that we need to wrestle with. Will you do that? Abraham said, verse, sorry, verse 24, suppose there were 50 righteous within this city. 50. Just 50. Just 50. Just 50. Just 50. Just 50! Will you also destroy the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous that were in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing as this, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous should be as the wicked. Far be it from you, shall not the judge of all the earth do right. Abraham was challenging God. The Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, yes, sir. Then I will spare all the place for their six. If I find those fifty, I will spare everywhere. You see, some people, when we talk about making it back, see, we sing, you know, our family song, we're doing all that. Some people think that it takes a large number to make an impact. No. It takes a dedicated few. Committed to a goal to make an impact. That is the way it has always been. The, the apostles and disciples that saw the world outside, there were a few persecuted people. But they had a focus. There was something they wanted to do. So it's not to keep. Hey, man, you make this thing, please. You guys are going to be with me. They don't like it. Now, okay. Right? Because we're still going to say, Amen. And Abraham answered and said, Indeed, now I who I am but dust and ashes, I'm taking it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Okay, so Abraham continues the Bible. Suppose there were five less than the 50 righteous. Will you destroy it? all for the city? This reminds me of it's like, you know, when you're buying things in Africa, you don't buy it so much in this place. They, they give you a price, you say, Will you take this one? The person said, yes. Will you take this one? I said, no, no, no. Will you take this one? That's what he was doing. He was bargaining with her. So five less than 50 righteous. Will you destroy all of the city for the lack of five? He said, if I find here for the five, I will not destroy it. And he spoke to him yet again and said, suppose there should be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. And he said, let, it, let not the Lord be angry. I will speak. Suppose 30 should be found there. He said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. And he said, indeed now, I have taken it upon myself to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 should be found there. He said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 20. Then he said, let not the Lord be angry and I will speak. But once more, suppose 10 should be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for the sake of 10. Look at that. Abraham assumed that 10, he counted a lot. That's his. Nephew, he counted the wife, the children, and all that. that. There will surely be ten there. So Abraham stopped at ten. But well, you know what? They could not find ten there. They could not find ten there. But the principle here is that as we stand before God, in other words, it takes a few people to make a difference. And that difference that we're talking about starts with prayer. Somebody say prayer. 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 
the first remedy of God for a city is a committed people who are ready to stand before God until something happens. There's something we used to call push. Pray until something happens. Everybody say pray until something happens. Pray until something happens. So, so we're talking about joy in the city this morning. The first thing is a committed people who wants to see great things done in the city and they get before God to get them alone. They begin to pray for those great things. All through history. All through history. Whenever God's people get together and start to pray, God begins to move. God begins to move upon the land. So everything that we're seeing happening all around us in the, in the, in the, in the community of the nation is a pointer to the prayerlessness of the church. And I get that amen in this house. It's a testament to the prayerlessness of the church. Second Chronicles 7 14 puts an if there. Second Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14 says, If my people, he didn't say the unbelievers, not the politicians, not those who don't know me. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and what? And pray. Someone say, humble themselves and pray. You know, sometimes it's, it takes humility to pray. Humility is dependence. Many of us are so, we talked about grace last month. You know, we are so active. Like we know, we want to resolve everything. There are many activists in this city. I mean, I, I'm constantly about them. In fact, my head is full of activists right now because I just finished writing my dissertation on all these activists that blah, 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 blah. there's just so much activists and all kinds of those things are good. But you discover that the results are not commensurate to the activities. Why? Because there's a factor that is being removed from it. And that's the prayer factor. Someone say the prayer factor. That's why I love this thing that is happening all over the city right now, like pray Chicago, you know. Um, we are all getting together from different you know, we're praying all over me, you know, stay headed by uh, my former professor at Moody, Dr. Fugel, and then we have this wine and monkey thing, you know, that is taking place. People are praying, you know, praying everywhere, pastors are coming together and all that. Something is happening. There's these people who do the concert, uh, what do you call it? Cry, what do you call it? Cry America, right? Cry America, it's beginning to happen. My wife also got dropped into her heart to pray. So every every Sunday now, before service, she, she takes some women, some people, they gather downstairs and they are praying together. They are praying together. God is carrying on the spirit of God of prayer. Because it's not just in the city that the devil is at work in, even in the homes, is that he's trying to destroy homes. Amen. Amen. He's trying to do that. But the way you we, we come against it. It's through what? Through prayer. Everybody say prayer. prayer. Please, you can go and sit down over there. I, I, I don't know the problem. You guys are not. You are not preachers. You are singers. You are singers. <laughs> stay very close. Because I'm going to be calling you all. Very slow. Before your husband. So like Pray Chicago. Pray Chicago is organized by Dr. Fuda. And... You know, people from everywhere. The last meeting we had, we had it at uh, Mix Church, uh, Reverend Mix Church. People from everywhere gathered and we're praying for the city of Chicago. We pray for the city of Chicago. The same thing with the Rana Bucket. There's a spirit of prayer that God is stirring up. Go back to 2 Chronicles 7 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray. And seek my face. That was a seek my face. Seek my face. You know, that was that face. You know, we started from call up to me and I will answer you and I will show you what I'm eating. Sometimes the face of God needs to be sought. Do you get it? 
It's not cheap. You see, anybody that you can see their face all the time cheaply, that person is not worth, you will not, you know, you will not have value. God's face must be sought. God's will must be sought. I have somebody say yes, thank you. I mean, at least I know that somebody is listening. Amen. And turn from their wicked ways. Now, this is not that the world should turn from their wicked ways. It wasn't talking about the world. It's not talking about the people in the city right now. It's talking about his people, his covenant people, that they were the one that took off from their wicked ways. There's so many wicked things going on within the church. God is calling the church to repentance. Someone say repentance. Repentance. And one of the things that we need to repent of is this prayerlessness, this uh, you know, low value for spiritual pursuits. Low value for things of, for spiritual pursuits. We can spend three hours at a game, but we cannot spend two hours in church. Church. Amen. Moment you get to get your time, start looking at your time. And then where are you going? You are going to watch something that's going to take you another four, take you four hours. You're going to do something else that's going to take you. You're going to be talking, you're going to be doing all that. In other words, the value that is placed on spiritual things is so low. So low. That's at the church. Is to, I mean, is to blame for it. We're talking about prayer in the schools. Why should there be prayers in the school when there are not prayers in the churches? I mean, say, oh, they are taking prayer out of the schools. No, it's not just the school. The churches, the devil has taken prayers out of the churches. Why should there be prayers in the government houses when there is no prayer in the houses? We got to bring prayer back. Someone say we got to bring prayer back. We got to bring prayer back. I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin. And what will happen? Everybody, what will happen? Amen. I will heal their land. I will heal their land. So in other words, the healing begins with God's people, and then it overflows to the land. Did you get that? It starts revival, starts with God's people before it flows to the land. If the church is weak and everybody is struggling to even pray for two minutes and stop struggling to read the Bible and husbands are not praying with wives and children are not, I mean, just stop, you know. What's going to happen to the land? Don't even talk about the land. Amen. It has to start with the church. It has to start with standing before the Lord and praying. And that's when great things will begin to happen in our city. Great things begin to happen in our city. Jeremiah 29, verse 7. What is God's solution to the city? God's solution to the city is a church that is awake. What is God's solution to the city? God's Solution to the city is a church that is awake. I'm not talking about being awake physically. I'm talking about being awake spiritually. Everybody say spiritually. spiritually. It's a church that is awake. It's a church that is awake. The way peace will come into the city is when God's people begin to seek the peace of the city and begin to pray to the Lord for the city. He said, I seek the peace of the city. Everybody say, Pe seek the peace of Chicago. Say the peace of Chicago. Right here, everybody say, say, seek the peace of Chicago. Say the peace of Chicago. Say it. Say, seek the peace of Chicago. Seek the peace of Chicago. You know, seek. What does it mean to seek? You go after you. You, you look for it. It's like something that is lost. You get it? So you begin to go after it because you want to find it. Peace is not just going to come, it's not just going to land, it has to be sought. There has to be some people who seek for it. There has to be some people that plead for it. There has to be some people that work for it. There has to be some people that live for it. And God is telling us then, seek the peace of the city. Seek the peace of the city. The word peace there is the Hebrew word shalom. Seek the shalom of the city. 
Let me tell you what Shalom means. Shalom, that's how uh, you know Jewish people they greet themselves. You know, Shalom, that's that's what they say. And you know what it means? It means when they say shalom to you, and you say shalom, what it means is it's well with you. Peace with your wholeness with you. The word shalom means completion. Everything being intact. Nothing missing and nothing broken. So when you talk about the peace of the city, you are talking about a city where nothing of God is missing. Are you listening? You want to do your vacation, there's a place to do it. Amen? In the city. I'm talking, I'm just creating a picture. Is it healthcare? There's healthcare. Right. Good schools. Right. There's good schools. In every neighborhood, that's shallow. Good churches. On in every neighborhood, kids can run around in the park right. Right. without adult supervision and without being afraid that somebody's going to come there and shoot them or steal them. That's shallow. Are you listening? Yes, shallow is when you see kids play sports and everybody's laughing and they enjoy themselves and people the adults are watching them and clapping that's a manifestation of shallow shallow is when broken down buildings begin to be rebuilt and beautiful ones start coming out of those both broken down buildings that's shallow amen shallow is when two people who they have, they come from different backgrounds, they don't look alike, they don't have the same skin color and they, that, and they are both laughing together and they are both praying together. That brotherhood that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about is shallow. You know, the dream that they had when they said that, you know, I dream of a time when the son of this former slave owner and the, for, the son of the children of the former slave owners and the children of the former slaves will be playing together. And nobody will be judged any longer by the color of their skins or by the content of their character. That's shallow that he was speaking about. That's shallow that he was speaking about. Where we can hold hands and cry together, laugh together, even though our backgrounds are different. That's shallow. Shalom is the coming together of all the beauties of God in a person or in a place. That's what peace is. It's the coming together of all the things of God, all the ethnicities, all the, the wealth. There's so much wealth in every city. There's so much wealth in every nation. God put so much wealth there. When those things are tapped into and that wealth becomes manifested, that's what shalom is. That's what shalom is. So shalom is not just an experience of, ooh, I feel some peace. No, shalom is a tangible thing. It's a tangible thing. It is whole neighborhoods. It's good houses. It's good clinics. It's good schools. It's children playing. It's whole marriages. It's old people working together and they have been married for, you know, 70 years. It's health. It's long life. Is having money. His business is coming to a community and growing and thriving. It's a coffee shop where people gather together and laugh and they do, they have conversations and they share of what is going on in life. That's God's operationalization of the word peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. Everybody say after say nothing missing, nothing broken. That's peace. So Jeremiah 29 verse 7 says, So seek the peace of the sea where I have caused you to be carried away captive. He was talking to captives. They were taken to Babylon. It was a city that captured them. The city was, the city was harsh on them. They were taken from Jerusalem and they were taken to Babylon. But God was speaking to them that even though that city captured you, what I want you to do is for you to seek the peace of that city. Amen. For in the peace you will have peace. Pray to sorry, I'm praying to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. Another translation says, for because peace is everything, prosperity, health, everything. It says, but if it prosper, 
you also what? You will prosper. If the city prospers, you will prosper. Let me round up. And we're going to pray. And we're going to sing that song. We're going to, we're going to get into a prophetic mode. And we're going to pray. We're going to pray. If it prospers, you will prosper. The solution of God for the city is people. Someone say people. People. It's people. It's God's people. God's people. At the beginning, is they begin to pray to the Lord for the city. They begin to pray to the Lord for the city. They begin to declare prophetically over the city. They begin to declare prophetically over the city. Hallelujah. Amen. Proverbs 11 verse 10. Proverbs 11 verse 10. You are the solution to the city. You are the answer. You are God's genius for the city. It is people. The first thing is that when it goes well with the righteous, what happens to the city? The city rejoices. In other words, well, you see that word well, well, wellness is shallow. When the righteous, when they become whole, the city rejoices. But when the wicked perish, there's jubilation. When it goes well with the righteous, the city rejoices. We're talking about joy in the city. Must enjoy it. Somebody say joy in the city. How do you put joy in the city? Wellness of the righteous. Someone say wellness of the righteous. It is you. You becoming whole spiritually. It's you becoming whole mentally. It's you becoming whole in your marriage. It's you becoming a light with your finances. It's you becoming a voice. It's you reflecting it. It starts from us. Let's bring it down a little bit. It starts from us. We have to model it. When the right, when the, when it goes well with the righteous, the city who does what? The city rejoices. The city rejoices. In transition says, when the righteous prospers, what happens to the city? The city rejoices. When the righteous prospers, the city rejoices. When the righteous prospers, the city. When the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. Hallelujah. Are you getting it, everyone? Are you getting it? Are you getting it? They pray to the Lord for the city. Look at what God said in Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. Jonah 4, 11. This verse, every time I read it, this is God's view for the city. It's the God of the city. When Jonah, when God told Jonah to go and preach to that city, a great city that was against God and all that, Jonah, you know, ran away, and then later, they, you know, the, the fish caught him and all that. Then he went back. And after he did it, and the people repented, he was not angry that God, how did, why did you forgive them so easily? They repented. You told me to go and prophesy they were going to die. But how do you forgive them so easily? So while he was sulking, while Jonah was sulking and hungry, God told him, he says, go back, go to verse 10. Let's see the beginning. Go to verse, go to verse 10. God said to Jonah, do you have a right to be angry about the vine? Now, you know, you know what? You need to understand what the vine is. While Jonah was sulking there, there was, go, go, go back. I think it will help us understand it. Go, 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 go up a little bit uh, to maybe like six or seven. Right, and see. Jonah went and sat up to the place east of the city. Just like we had east of the city. I'm say east of the city. <laughs> then he made himself a shelter and he sat in the shade and waited to see what would happen to the city. Isn't, isn't that what, what we do sometimes as church? We sit in the shade, amen, right? And say, let's see what's going to happen to the city. But the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. What a loving God. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. You know, as God put a covering over him and he was very happy that wow, God is working in my life. That is sometimes what happens in the church. A little testimony, a little prosperity, a little, uh, what they call it, settling and all that, and then we are, we are happy. And then we sit down to watch what happens to the city. And let's see what happens to the city. At least my children are safe. We have my house. 
I got my job. I live in the suburbs. I always run there. But I thought the next day God provided a walk which should be fine so that it will that. <laughs> when the song was God provided a scorching east wind and the song placed on Jonah's head so that he grew faith. This is how the Lord works with him. Amen. He wanted to die and said, It will be better for me to live and to die. Let me tell you something. When the church refuses to be a blessing to the sin, God causes things to happen, allows things to happen. So that people become aware. That's what happened to the church in Acts. It was persecution rose, and then they were all forced to go out. And then the Bible says, Philip went to Samaria. Verse 9. But God wanted to teach Jonah a lesson. But God said to Jonah, Do you have the right to be angry about the crime? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. This guy is very. <laughs> but you see people talking with God, like you saw your brother, you see Jonah now. The Lord said, you have, you have been concerned about this vine, though you did not end it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right from their left. And many cattle. In fact, God is even concerned about the animals in the city. God is thinking about the dogs. Should I not to be concerned about that great city? Now, God is calling the city of 120,000 people a great city. Every 120,000. That's like a huge city now. I mean, that's a village. Chicago has 2.9 million people in the Chicago itself. In Chicago land, Chicago has 10 million people. So, you see how concerned God is. And just, that's just people. Now, think of all the animals that are in Chicago. You know, some people there, they're like, oh, you know, like environmentalism and all that. I know some people can take those things to great extremes. Global warming and all. They can take it to extremes, turn it into a political thing. Things that are true, it's not a political thing. But it's just common sense. If God gave you a house, I'm supposed to take care of it. Right? If He gave you a planet, are you not supposed to take it and take care of it? I suppose you just let it just waste pour oil on these all that destroy everything. God is concerned about the people. God is concerned about the animals. God is concerned about the environment of the city. God is concerned about the cleanliness, the beauty, the flowers. Isn't he one that made all the mountains and all that? That I mean, he must be somebody who loves beauty. So he doesn't want the walls to be full of trash. See trash scattered everywhere. That's not the will of God. God is a God of excellence. God wants the city to look like some suburbs. You know, you go to some suburbs, right? And you're like, wow, this is like heaven. God's plan is that every part of the city looks that way. But it's only going to happen when we begin to express God's love. The Bible says, by the blessing, the last scripture, by the blessing of the righteous, the city is exalted. But by the curse of the wicked, it is overthrown. By the blessing of the righteous, the city is exalted. Please let me find the amplified version of that. It says, the blessing is, is you know, the blessing, you know what? As, the, as we begin to say good things, that's why I will never subscribe to calling Chicago Shira or the most segregated city in the world, you know, or any of those things. I love Chicago. Amen. By the blessing and the influence, ever say influence, of the upright and God's favor because of them, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. So meaning it is the influence. Someone say influence. It's our influence. It's the influence of the righteous. 
It is your influence in the schools. It's your influence on TV. It's your influence at work. It's your influence in the neighborhood. It's the influence of the church. It's the, you know, it's what we do with the kids. You know, we're having a summer camp now dedicated. They're going to be bringing kids from Inglewood, from everywhere. It is your influence. We're starting something. They're going to be sending those kids from prison. They're going to be coming into this place. You know, they're going to be working with them. It's your influence. The influence by the influence of the righteous. Someone say influence. And God's favor, because of them, the city is exalted. So we, you see, we have a greater role to play in our neighborhoods than we are playing. Many of us don't attend neighborhood meetings. We don't even know, you know, what's happening at block. We don't know the next neighbor. We don't even know the name of our other man. We don't know where his office is. Amen. How many of you know where the office of the other man is in this place? Okay, good. Like five percent, less than five percent. How many of you have been in any board meeting in this place? Those two, three. Amen. How many of you shop in the neighborhood, or you shop downtown alone? I was at the coffee shop there, Sipa and whatever. Even though it's not the best coffee, it's a great one. It's not the but it was this one. Our home, amen. It's our home. Hallelujah. It's our home. Visit the place. Be there, buy coffee from them, amen. Instead of Starbucks, Starbucks. You know where they want us to Buy. The restaurants that are starting all around, go in there. Buy. If you don't like, tell them correct this one, correct this one, let it look nice after. That's shalom. That's shalom. That's shalom. These churches are all pray for them. We are partners. We are partners. This that's what we're talking about. Amen. By the influence of the righteous, the city is exalted. But it is overthrown by the mouth of the wicked. Their mouths, they overthrow it. What they what they are saying about the city, they overthrow it. So we have to start using our words well concerning the city. Yeah. I love Chicago. Everyone say, I love Chicago. I love Chicago. <laughs> say, I love the United States of America. I love the United States of America. Say, I love this city. I love this city. I love this nation. I love this nation. And I prophesy joy and glory to this and I city. And joy. Everybody shout, they say, there is joy in the city. There is joy in the city. No, I want you to shout it again. Say, there is joy in the city. There is joy in the city. Say there is joy on the south. Nine joy on the south. There is joy on the north. Nine joy on the north. There is joy on the west. Nine joy on the west. And there is joy on the east. And I joy on the east. Because I am the righteousness of God. Because I am the righteousness. Say 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 because I am the righteousness of God. Because I am the righteousness of God. Through my influence. Through my influence. Through my blessing. Through my blessing. Through my increase. Through my increase. This city is exalted. This city is exalted. By the time all is said and done. By the time all is said and done. When my life is over. When my life is over. When my journey is over. When my journey is over. They will say he walked through this city. They will say walk through the city. And he used his influence for this city. And he used his for this city. And the rest of the city. And the rest of the city. In every way. In every way that they are. That is what we have been called to do. That's what we have been called to do. And you don't have to be born here to do it. You have been brought here by God. The Bible says he has the time the born for God to take you. He has the time where you live at every time. God has brought you here because there's something that he wants you to do in this city. Begin to love this city. Begin to build houses in the city. Begin to buy houses in the city. Begin to settle down in the city. Begin to walk around the neighborhood. Begin to play, do sport, swim, go to the neighborhood meetings. Do everything and let your influence prevail the entire planet for me a singular. Stand up for your feet. Stand up everybody say I love Chicago. I love Chicago. We're gonna pray prophetically for Chicago right now. We're gonna pray. So we'll sing that song and then we're gonna get into prayers. Sing the song, everybody. We're gonna sing that song and then we're gonna get into prayers. You're the king of this people. You're the Lord of this nation. We're praying. We're praying. Lift your hands and pray. You are. You're the light in this darkness. You're the hope to the hopeless. 
15. It was 11 verse 15. The Holy Spirit just brought that verse to me. And I think it's a word of prophecy to a lot of people here. He said, if they had loved for the country, the country they came from, they would have come back. Something about Abraham and all those people. They would have come back. Verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. And indeed, He has prepared a city for them. He has prepared a city for them. Another verse says that they long for a city whose builder and maker is what? Is God. A city. Please project that verse for me. A city whose builder and maker is God. Let's lift our voices together right now. I want us to pray. With our hands still joined together. Let's just begin to speak some words of prayer right now over the city of Chicago. There's something that touches you. There's something you've heard about. There's something that you know that you've seen, you heard on the news. But apart from that, there's a dream that God has put in your hands for the city. For your life. Because when the righteous prosper, the city rejoices. I have dreams for this church and its influence upon the city. And there are dreams that God has deposited in every one of us for this purpose that He has. Let me know that He has said He was waiting for a city which has fixed and found foundation, whose architect and builder is God. Let me know pray for that city right now. Want to see that city? Now see. I want to see it in my neighborhood. Make it concrete. Ask God. Say, come up to me and I will say, come on, pray like city life. Pray like city life. Pray like city life. Okay, lift your hand. Lift your hand. Walk around and pray. Lift your hand. Walk around and pray. Walk around. Pray like city life. Lift up your voices. See it through the prayer.
Yeah, so he would like to just meet with you, uh, talk to you, and uh, uh, share a little bit about our story and also find out about yours. I want to find just fellowship with you. So once again, welcome to those that are worshiping with us uh, for the very first time. Welcome also to our internet audience. Thank you for joining us. Um, we know that you know, as you heard about this, um, the message that you carry it wherever you are and spread it as well. That you're in your in your environment that God has placed you. Praise the Lord. There's going to be a very brief meeting. Uh, uh, there's going to be a training for the right hand donkey crusade immediately after this service. I don't know if you are aware of the right hand donkey crusade. I know Pastor told us to pray, pray about it. Everybody, I don't know if you are attending. I don't know if you are planning to come for the great donkey. Can you project it up? How many of you are planning to attend? All right, just a few of you. Now, okay, let me tell you, when I was a little boy, like I shared many times, um, I was, you know, invited for a monkey crusade. I was 13 years old, and I didn't want to go. But I thank God that I went because that was where I met Jesus. And I'm standing here today as an example, a product of that crusade. So if you were not planning to attend, I want you to readjust your mind, plan, replan your schedule, and attend. I make sure you bring someone along, along. Next week, by the grace of God, we're going to get the names of the people that will be inviting. We're going to be praying over those names. I hope you are praying over the names of the people that you are inviting. You know, we don't want you to just come. We want you to bring your friends, invite your friends. We are looking for. We are, we are uh, looking to get two buses that will take us from here to the place. So you don't have to worry about transportation. You can just come here, park your car. And then, you know, the bosses will take you to the venue and bring you back. So please don't, don't keep your joy to yourself. Don't keep the salvation. They said, restore to me the joy of my salvation. They say, joy that comes because we are saved. We should not keep it to ourselves. We must spread it. We must let everybody hear it. It's, it doesn't have to be complicated. Let everybody hear your testimony. Let them hear how God said. Let them hear what Jesus is doing. Because Jesus is doing a lot in our lives. We shouldn't keep it to ourselves. So talk to your friends. Talk to your co-workers. Talk to your neighbors. Take flyers out in our GQ. We had a testimony of one of our members just going, knocking at the door of the neighbor that they never even really talked to. When they just started sharing about this thing, it opened a, a link for communication between the two of them. So don't be afraid. The Bible says the righteous is as bold as a what? As a lion, they're not supposed to be intimidated by anybody. Just go and say, hello, how are you doing? I would like you to come for this event. It's free and your life will not be the same again. You know, if we can do, do the same for Chicago Bulls, we can promote the Chicago Bears, and if we can promote the Hawks, if we can promote all the sports that we if we can promote the NBA, where can we promote Jesus, for goodness sake? Let's promote Jesus, for goodness sake. Let's promote Jesus because worthy of our promotion. Amen. So for those of you who express, express interest in volunteering after the service in the green room, we're going to have training for you. Pastor Lamb will train us for one hour. We won't take your time. It's going to be quick and then you'll be gone. And then on, on the day of the event, um, you'll be there to volunteer. We'll also pass information to you on, on, on that. Hallelujah. For the uh, summer program, we prayed about it as well. If you need information on the pricing and all the all, all the stuff, please see Osens, the Osen, there you go, she's there, uh, and Ruby, who's not around now, but Osen will be able to assist you with any questions that you have. The dates are there, June 29th to August 7th, from 8.30 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. in the afternoon. There's aftercare uh, uh, provided as well. Uh, so, but also we'll be able to give you all the details that you need. Hallelujah. I think I think those are the major announcements that we have for now. Can we just prepare our tithes and offer? We're going to give our offerings to the Lord right now. Uh, those are the different ways you can give. You can give uh, using a check. You can make it out to the city line. There's the um, uh, offering kiosk at the back. You can pay using your debit or credit card. You can give via the phone or your text. Um, if you want to give with a check or cash, you can just signify your hand and the ushers will get you an envelope. Hallelujah. We're having Kingdom Culture immediately after this service. We would like to ask all the adults after the service to just um, move outside, um, downstairs to the fellowship hall. You can continue your conversations there if you want. Uh, the new members, the new visitors will, will be reaching out to you before the end of the service. 
Can we just lift up our offering before the Lord? Or lift up your phone? Or whatever it is you're going to be giving with. And just let's just pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to give to you. We thank you for the service. We thank you, Lord, because you gave to us first. And you gave your son to us. And, and, and Lord, now, at this time of the service, we just want to offer our thanks to our offerings to you, to our substance. We give it to you with, with reverence and with respect. And we give it with, with this assurance that when we give, it shall be given to us. Good measure, praise down and shake it together. Shall men give to our bosom. We give it to you knowing that every need is met. Every bill is paid in the name of Jesus. We give it to you knowing that you've opened the windows of heaven and you're pouring out a blessing and you're pouring out divine ideas on, 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 on how to increase and all of our, our, our substance in the name of Jesus. We give it to you knowing that our bags are full of plenty and that we're not lacking any good thing in the mighty name of Jesus. We give it to you knowing that we are overflowing in abundance and we're giving to every good work and charity and revelation. Lord, we give you praise, we honor you in Jesus' name. Pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's rise up and end with our song. Let's sing the song.